Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. The topic this time is eight best practices for moving your firm to the cloud. This webinar is hosted by the ABA Legal Technology Resource Center, and speaking today will be Casey Johnson from Cloud9 Realtime. The Legal Technology Resource Center is an ABA member benefit provided by the ABA's Law Practice Division. The LTRC has been providing lawyers with legal technology guidance for more than 25 years. You can find a variety of legal technology articles, guides, videos, and other resources on our website at www.lawtechnology.org or our blog, www.lawtechnologytoday.org. Casey Johnson is Cloud9's Executive Vice President and is a regular speaker and commentator at accounting, legal, and technology conferences nationwide, focusing on business development and education about cloud technologies. Awarded the CPA Practice Advisor Magazine's Top 40 Under 40 Award in 2012 and 2013, she is recognized as one of the young professionals leading the technology profession into the future. Casey is dedicated to helping companies adapt to doing business in the cloud and bridge the gap between users, applications, and IT. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll now begin the webinar. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, my name is Casey Johnson, and I am with Cloud9 Realtime. Uh, today's webinar, as Rose said, would be eight best practices for moving your firm to the cloud. A little bit about Cloud9. We are a US-based company with headquarters in San Diego, California. We are commercially licensed hosts by Intuit, Sage, and Microsoft in both the United States as well as Canada. We're an accredited managed service provider by MSP Alliance and deploy all of our servers here on U.S. territory at SOC 2 SSAE 16 certified data centers. We've won a few awards in the last few years because we're different than most hosting providers in that uh, we have eliminated connection managers, so there's no Citrix or other clunky downloads to get into your cloud. Uh, it's a very seamless experience and actually feels as though the applications are running on your local machine. We have been building custom cloud solutions since 2000, and we have a 12-page white paper for legal professionals specifically uh, that after the webinar, it will be offered that you can download that for free. So let's first discuss a little bit about what is cloud computing and the differences between types of cloud. Uh, cloud is being used as a metaphor for the Internet. Combine that with computing, and you have virtual servers that are hosting all of your services and software online. Um, virtual servers allow users a way to increase capacity and add capabilities quickly without a large investment in new infrastructure. So if your firm needed a new server, you would typically either have an internal IT person or contract with a local IT company. They would give you a proposal on what type of infrastructure you're going to need to buy that has a life cycle of anywhere between three to five years, and then you would have all the IT maintenance licensing, um, and then, of course, hardware costs. The cloud is much, much different. Um, it's a scalable environment, so think of it kind of like an electricity grid where you're actually able to have uh, access to a large amount of resources, but you're only paying for what you actually use, and you can increase that or decrease that over the next few years based upon how you grow your firm. Um, one of the great benefits of the cloud is that the users working in the cloud don't actually need to have knowledge of, expertise in, or even control over the cloud that supports them. It also allows businesses the savings of not having to train new personnel and license new software, but it's still providing your common business applications online access through a web browser so you're not tied to your desk or to your local office. Um, you're essentially able to access all of your applications anytime, anywhere from any device with internet connection. Now, a lot of people think that the cloud is something new, when in fact it has been around for decades. It's just large corporations such as uh, you know, IBM, BMW, Amazon have only been able to afford it because it was quite costly back in the day. Now, as technology advancements have um, come so much further, then the cost of cloud has come down dramatically. So that's why you're hearing the big message of get in the cloud, because it's actually not only that you can afford the benefits of cloud, but it's almost cheaper to be in the cloud than have a traditional on-site infrastructure. Now, there's a few things that the cloud is made up of. It is the physical servers and network appliances. It is the software applications that you are working in, and it is your data storage. It has an estimated infrastructure of about $452 billion. 
Now, there's a few different types of cloud that you um, are going to hear marketed, and I like to kind of tell you the different ones because they're not all the same. Not all clouds are created equal. <laughs> um, first, you have hosting, and that's what we do. That is where a managed service provider is giving you infrastructure as a service. The acronym is IAAS, Infrastructure as a Service. That is where virtual servers are hosting all of your applications, your data, and your users in one central location. So it is essentially outsourcing your physical servers so you no longer have local servers and IT people to manage those. Um, second type of cloud is online access. And this is actually probably the first way that you were introduced to cloud through online banking. Uh, it's logging in via a browser to view transactional information. It's not a full application that you're working in. It's more of a website that allows you to view account information and maybe make transfers, but it, it's mainly just online access. Then there's storage. This is online portals. This is growing very, very rapidly. Um, with companies like ShareFile, Dropbox, Box.com, and even a lot of law firms are now having portals on their website so that their clients can either upload or download documents uh, that need to be secured. Um, this is truly just for data transfer or data storage. This isn't, again, an application that you're working in. Then there's software as a service. SAS is the acronym on this one. And it is an application that a manufacturer or vendor has created an online edition for. It is just their application. It's not all of your applications and all of your data. It's everything in regards to that one application. It's not their full desktop edition. It usually uh, is a little bit different. So um, if anybody out there is familiar with QuickBooks made by Intuit, they have QuickBooks the desktop version, and then they have QuickBooks Online. The QuickBooks Online is their SaaS offering. Salesforce is another very popular SaaS offering out there. So these are the four different types of cloud solutions out there. The one that um, we'll be talking in terms of best practices about cloud in general and all different types of clouds. Uh, but when we get into the hosted model, then that's what Cloud9 does. We are providing infrastructure as a service. So let's get into the best practices. Um, we've come up with eight to kind of condense it. I could actually probably come up with 25 very easily. And if you read the white paper, it has a lot more in it than just these eight. But uh, I think eight is a nice round number and fits in well with uh, our timetable today. So number one, flexibility. Uh, if, if you've ever had a local server, you know that you have the same um, freedom and flexibility in terms of what applications you can host. And that is a lot of what the cloud gives people, which they maybe don't realize if you have a private virtual server. Now, again, there's different types of virtual servers out there. There's uh, public servers, there's private servers, and then there's a hybrid cloud of the solution. So um, what we're talking about today are private virtual servers that give you the same freedom and flexibility as what a local server would give you. Uh, it allows you to have the same software applications you currently run, all of your current data, except for now you're getting the flexibility of having access anytime, anywhere, through any device and in the world. Uh, you don't need to be locked down to that. It also gives you the flexibility with collaboration. So you can collaborate with your other partners and staff. You may need uh, applications to be able to open in multi-user mode so that the partners, the attorneys, employees, owners, and the accountant can all be working in the same files at the same time. Um, and this also allows for your accounting software to be kept up to date and viewable in real time. You don't have to create accounts, copies, send files back and forth, etc. It also gives you the flexibility with multiple offices. We've seen a lot of software programs to where you have to buy a license for every single office. And if you have remote employees, it removes um, the functionality there as well or else increases your cost because now you have to buy multiple licenses for multiple offices or uh, locations that has to be installed. When you work in the cloud, it removes all of that. You only need one license because it's on one cloud server that people are accessing from multiple locations. So flexibility is definitely a big best practice that in any cloud solution you're going to want to look for. Um, and this isn't to say that all cloud solutions offer all of these things. We're just saying the best practice of what um, the best cloud solutions are going to offer to you and things to look out for. Scalability. We talked a little bit about this when introducing the cloud. Scalability is a huge benefit of the cloud and one of the main reasons that people move to it because you don't want to have to purchase a large infrastructure that you may or may not grow into. 
um, that you know you're going to have to replace in three to five years. So you want something that's going to keep up with technology advancement, as well as allow you to uh, grow with it or downgrade if maybe your, your firm takes a different turn. So um, the highly scalable nature of the cloud, uh, you want to find out about that as well as, of course, storage fees because lawyers have a strict data retention policy by the, their managing boards. So you're going to want to make sure um, that you understand everything about the scalability and cost of adding or decreasing resources and how much you're going to grow, what your growth rate in your firm is. But the scalability allows for cloud to be uh, easily allocated in terms of resources, and it's a highly monitored environment. Number three, security. This is definitely one of the top concerns that I hear about uh, and get asked about when I'm out at the, the legal conferences. And I'd like to kind of answer some questions, get a, give everybody some education on security, and let you know what you should be looking for in any type of cloud solution that you uh, may run into out there. First of all, you want to make sure that uh, all of the data centers are kept onshore, not offshore, unless your um, state or federal boards don't you know, regulate that. But uh, the security um, protocols, it used to be SAS 70 that people looked at. The AICPA eliminated SAS 70 reports in December of 2012 and replaced those with SOC 2 reports, SSAE 16. Um, so those are the certified data centers that you're going to want to look for. Encryption, it, there's all different um, levels of encryption. 256-bit is what I would say is a standard. Many will have 128-bit. Both are secure, but it's just about how many layers you're going to go through. Automatic backups, um, we recommend at least daily. Now, you can have more frequently to where you can have you know, every 8 hours, every 12 hours, every hour, every 4 hours. Um, but you want to make sure it's done at least once a day and that they're kept off-site. You don't want them sitting right next to the server that is right there. I mean, then if there's a natural disaster or something happens in that uh, data center, well, next to it is the backup, so they're both on. Uh, so off-site automatic backups at least daily. An uninterrupted power supply. So this is going to allow it that if something happened in the geographic region of your data center, you are not going to experience any downtime. So you know, if let's say um, your local excuse me electricity electricity provider goes down, they need to have generators to come up and have a long enough supply to keep you up until um, the the power goes back up in the region. Mirror disk imaging, this will allow for it's not just individual uh, files that are backed up, but actual servers. So um, what we do in terms of our backup is full mirror disk imaging so that if a server got corrupt, we just pull the last backup of the full server from the night before, and you're up within 20 minutes. On a physical server that you would have in your office, you don't have that option. If you have a hard drive fail or something happens to your server, you have to have your IT guy rebuild the server if they can't fix that problem, which could take days if not weeks to do. So mirror disk imaging is definitely a huge uh, plus on moving to the cloud. Just gives you a lot more redundancy. Um, Raid implementation. 24-7 on-site monitoring, N plus 1 or 2N redundancy on all systems, and emergency support. So 24-7, I know a lot of our clients work all hours of the day and they're all over the globe. So they really need to be able to have that 24-7 support and not wait until uh, their local IT guy is in office. Again, security in a cloud environment is going to be threefold of what you would be able to create as a small to medium-sized business owner without investing hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is all that we do. So uh, these are three pictures of uh, our data center and what most SOC 2 SSAE 16 certified data centers are going to provide. Um, the top picture is of our NOC where we are just monitoring everything going on inside the system, not only for inclement weather in the area, but IP addresses coming into the system. We can turn off an entire country or individual IP. So we really know everything going on inside of our network. Uh, bottom picture is red and blue piping of the fire suppression and cooling rooms. Make sure servers are always kept at optimal temperatures. And then, of course, the generator room that is uh, 
not only going to keep us up if something happens in the geographic region, but also have contracts with two different diesel companies to keep those generators constantly fueled. Disaster recovery. I do a lot of educating on disaster recovery, and um, I'm always surprised how many companies do not have a disaster recovery plan at all. And it's not only their own business that they are putting at risk, but also their clients because of the data. Um, understand that there are about 15,000 hard disk drives that fail every single day. 94% uh, of companies that suffer a catastrophic data loss without having backed up their systems go out of business within two years. 70% um, of companies do not have a disaster recovery plan at all. 84% do not have natural disaster insurance. 40% of businesses will never reopen following a disaster. And small to medium-sized businesses lose on average $3,000 a day after closing to a disaster. So I cannot preach disaster recovery enough, and the cloud allows you to outsource a big portion of that. Obviously, it's not all of it, but everything in regards to your server and your data. Um, few best practices that I like to re recommend in terms of creating a disaster recovery plan, if you don't have one already, is um, obviously use the cloud. It will allow employees to telecommute in times of a disaster, and then you don't lose that uh, billable hour rate per day that you are down, whether that's your office being broken into, flooded, um, a natural disaster, whatever it may be. Uh, your clients will know that they'll, be, they'll feel a lot safer knowing that in that natural disaster, there was no data loss. Uh, the files are backed up at minimum daily, so there is no need to worry about data loss. And I highly recommend that you assign one employee to be in charge of your business continuity plan and develop um, a systematic approach to communicate with all of your staff at the times of that. Because most times when things like this happen, it's the partners you know, freaking out and calling everybody uh, on the employee roster or emailing everybody. And a lot of them won't be able to get email because they can't get to the office. Um, so definitely come up with a plan, assign one person as the point of contact so everybody's not uh, stepping on each other's toes and doing double the work. Now, there are a lot of questions as to legal entities working in the cloud and the ethics of it because of such sensitive client data. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, the ethics of cloud computing for legal practices was assured in March of 2010 uh, by quite a few courts, and it put data security into four fundamental areas. Um, the courts essentially said that attorneys have the responsibility on them that they must comprehend the technologies and practices that they will uh, be utilizing through their providers, through their chosen providers and that you must uh, leverage and effectively minimize the risks um, that could be associated by having uh, encryption. You need to have um, accredited hosts and data centers. You need to set proper passwords on all of, not only into the cloud, but on your local laptops and your mobile devices. And uh, you need to find out about the data availability from your not only data centers, your cloud providers, but also your ISP, because that's what's going to allow you to log in. ISP is for your internet service provider. Uh, this will effectively minimize the risks um, that are related to any kind of cloud computing. Cost savings. So, you know, with this big marketing push of getting to the cloud, um, there's a lot of kind of hazy zones of is it too expensive, oh, I hear that all the time, or is it really, really cheap and going to save us 70%. So um, I would say that it all really just depends on your firm and the needs. I can talk in generalities of what we usually see, and I can tell you what it replaced, um, but it all just depends on your firm, what you currently do, and uh, what you're going to need. So. In looking at your transition to the cloud, I would say, how much do you currently spend on not only hardware, but repairs, IT, billable hours, um, the maintenance of it, the personnel, the electricity of your server room, the racks, the networking, um, all of those pieces, and also licensing of software, so antivirus, uh, Windows Server licensing, Exchange Server licensing, Microsoft Office licensing, PDF program licensing, all of these things get replaced when moving to the cloud. 
Uh, you still will need internet connection and you will still need IT people to manage your local PCs, printers, scanners because the cloud is only responsible for what's in the data center and the server level, not responsible for your local uh, machines. Now, the, I do see on a regular basis that the cloud can save businesses on average 30 to 50 percent on IT costs annually. It reduces the startup costs, the overhead. Um, it also can eliminate the brick and mortar physical offices, allows you to go paperless. Um, it gives you a higher level of enterprise uh, hardware and resources, as well as the IT personnel. Customization. Definitely one of the big best practices. I am not a fan of cookie cutter. Um, I think that it is the provider then telling you how to do your business rather than listening to what you need. So one of the best practices that I recommend in looking at any cloud solution is customization. If they are going to put you in a box and tell you this is how you need to work, they're not listening to your needs as a consumer. So I say stay away from cookie cutter solutions. Um, I think that we need to listen to you, the client, ask you what you need and how you need it, and then build a solution to fit that need. Um, that allows you to pick the software applications that you want to use. Instead of telling you what to use, it allows you uh, to have the customized environment in terms of hardware, memory, space that need, needs for your business. You decide how often and when your backups are done, as well as where they're stored geographically. And it, pays you, it allows you to pay for what you use, not what you may need. So definitely customization is a big one. And number eight, automation. Um, this is obviously a big one because you don't want to have to worry when you put yourself up into the cloud still managing it. Um, that's one of the benefits of the cloud is that you don't have to be the IT administrator. Uh, a lot of cloud solutions out there are just basically empty space on a box that yes, gets rid of the server, but now you still have to buy all the licensing and you still have to pay all the IT fees. Automation will allow you to have your backups automated, your updates to your applications updated uh, regularly, as well as to the operating system and to the servers, monitor for suspicious activity, and do hardware upgrades. Um, you need to make sure that all of these things are done automatically with your cloud provider versus uh, you having to do them. So now, those are eight best practices, and we are going to um, kind of continue that conversation, but I'd like to show you exactly what the user experience is like, because I know a lot of people think, okay, this is going to be a huge transition, huge implementation, and too hard for my staff to learn. So let's look at what it actually is like for the users. Um, you get a desktop in the cloud that gives you all of your applications, full desktop version, the same way they are locally, whether it's installed on your PC or on a server, um, but now it's in the cloud. You can connect through a desktop icon. You can connect through a mobile device like an iPad. You can connect through a Mac, and you can connect through your laptop. Uh, you can also connect on a public device like a hotel computer. And again, it's your full server in the cloud. You launch the applications and it's in the full desktop version, all in multi-user modes. So everybody can be working in the same applications at the same time. Now, a lot of people ask us, well, what exactly do you host? Um, that's one of the problems I see with a lot of cloud technologies is that, sure, it gets rid of a lot of the applications you have to have locally, but it either requires you to switch applications or it, um, you know, is going to host or take care of half of them, but then have them self to run locally. Well, you want one central portal for everything, so you can really have a dummy terminal machine. We have a lot of clients that just use thin clients because they don't need anything locally. Everything is running in the cloud. We host over 500 applications in the cloud. I can't name them all. <laughs> we do have them listed on our website. Um, but I'd like to show you some examples of some of the more popular products that we host. Uh, we do host Abacus Law, Pro Law, the full Thomson Reuters suite, as well as CCH products. We host all the Intuit products, including QuickBooks, if that's your accounting software. We host all the Microsoft Office products, as well as uh, Microsoft Exchange services. We host all the Sage products, including Time Slips and Act. Um, we host, of course, PDF programs like Adobe. We host PC Law, LexisNexis products. Um, and then a lot of uh, online SaaS products like Bill.com, um, 
we do concur, um, smart vault, all those types of things we also integrate with. So again, we don't tell you what you can or cannot host on our environment. We ask you what you need hosted, what you currently use, or what you plan on using. We look at system requirements, make sure it's compatible with our environment and that you have proper licensing, and then we host those for you. We do buy some products for you so that you don't have to uh, worry about those licensing. We buy the Windows Server license, the SQL licensing, uh, Exchange licensing, full Microsoft Office suite, as well as the software that allows you to scan directly into the system, um, and then any and a PDF Reader Writer Pro, any other third-party softwares you would just provide the licenses you already own. I like to give a checklist of things that you should be asking at, to any type of cloud solution out there, whether it's a hosting provider, a SaaS provider, or oops, sorry about that, or um, an online portal, storage, anything. First, again, the data centers. How are they certified and where are they located? Um, if you're going with a hosting provider, uh, the accreditations, what are they and um, when were they done? If they're authorized commercial hosts, by the um, big three, you know, Microsoft Sage and Intuit. What is their SLA? This is service level agreement. This is where we were talking about ethics and uh, what the courts have deemed is your responsibility. Finding out about the service level agreement because this is going to tell you what their uptime guarantee is as well as backups and uh, support. Mobile device compatibility. Uh, all of us are becoming more and more dependent on our mobile devices, and lawyers are the same. You're in court, you're at a client, you're at home. I mean, you guys are constantly working. So whether you're on your phone, if you're on your tablet, if you're on your laptop, you want to make sure you have your full server, everything you need, all your apps, all your data, wherever you are, when you need it. Storage fees, I cannot stress this enough. I see a lot of people come to us because they went with one cloud provider and the storage fees got outrageous and it was a lot more than what they originally signed up for. We don't charge monthly storage fees, um, but this is something to definitely look out for. Restriction of applications, again, um, you don't want to end up with all these different portals that you have to log into and worrying about if they integrate together. You want to make sure that you have one single portal to go to, all of your applications are there. Server administration, who does it and is there any fees for it? License fees, what's included, what do you still need to purchase through your manufacturers? Um, seamless windows for multiple monitors. I personally use three monitors. Most of my clients use three or four. You don't want to lose the productivity that the multiple monitors give you. Our system is seamless with up to 16 monitors, but a lot of connection managers out there eliminate this, so make sure that whatever uh, cloud you go with that it does offer seamless windows for multiple monitors. And who owns the data? Big one, I again get contacted by a lot of people that went with a different provider and they want to move, they've had some kind of dispute with them or issue and they can't get their data back because they haven't paid their bill. Um, make sure that you own the data and then they can't keep it from you. Um, if you'd like to get a quote and find out exactly what kind of cost uh, comparison you can do, give us a call. Again, all of our servers are custom built, so we build custom proposals. Our phone number is 888-869-0076 to speak with somebody. You can always email sales at cloud9realtime.com. To get you a proposal, we will need to know how many users you'll have, how many people logging in, a full list of all the applications that not only you need hosted but also integrated with, and number of gigabytes of data that you have because, again, we don't charge storage fees, so we need to know how much data you have so we build you a large enough server to grow. Uh, there's a big cloud summit that um, a couple different cloud providers are hosting, and if you're really interested in moving to the cloud, it is the top. I go to about 50 conferences a year. I'm constantly on the road. This is the one to go to. Um, you should definitely check it out. It's cloudsummit2014.com. Uh, there will be a follow-up webinar to uh, today's. It's next week on February 26th, and that's a how-to cloud migration guide. Um, and I highly recommend that you join us. It is free, and you'll get a follow-up email to this offering you to download the white paper as well as join us for the follow-up how-to uh, cloud migration guide webinar.